Hello, book lovers, and welcome to another episode of Authors Love Bookstores from a Mighty Blaze. I'm your host, Joe Moldover, author of the novel Every Moment After, and I am delighted to be here with you today. This is our 109th episode of Authors Love Bookstores. Every week, my partner, Kimberly Hensel Lawrence, and I go across the country virtually meeting with independent booksellers and the authors who love them. And today I could not be happier to be in Savannah, Georgia with E. Shaver bookseller and co-owner Jessica Osborne. Jessica, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. And we are joined by George Dawes Green. Uh, for those of you who might not know, George is the founder of the iconic storytelling institution, The Moth and author of the novels, The Caveman's Valentine, The Juror, Ravens, and most recently, The Kingdoms of Savannah. Stephen King says, when Green isn't making you laugh, he's making you bite your nails down to the bleeding point. And Neil Gaiman says, uh, Kingdoms of Savannah is the apotheosis of Southern Gothic noir. Uh, I want to talk about that with you, George. But George, welcome to the show, and thank you for being here. It's great. It's great to be with you. George, I'm going to start off the conversation uh, with you. Uh, we are with uh, we're with Eshaver in Savannah, Georgia, um, because you chose them as your beloved independent bookseller. Will you tell us a little bit about this bookstore and what you love so much about them? I, I think I've I, I think I fell in love with Savannah like so many people because of Eshaver's bookstore. Uh, the first time uh, I was in Savannah, walking through one of these. I mean, it wasn't the first time I was in, in Savannah uh, in my life because I went to Savannah uh, many, many times as a child. But I had returned as an adult walking through the, through the squares, um, coming to this beautiful building. Um, there's E. Shavers, which is just, you know, it's a beautiful book, bookshop. But, but I, think, I think what's happened to it over the last few years is it's become... Um, it seems now to be the center of Savannah life. Um, it's, you know, you go in a bookshop and I had sort of thought, oh, I wonder if it's still going to be okay. This was a few years ago when I hadn't been in for a while. Um, it, uh, after, the, after the pandemic, um, it came back roaring. You go in there and it's filled with people and it's every book is so well cared for, um, and Jessica loves her authors and um, loves her her clients at the bookstore. And there's just a sense of this. Um, I don't know. It's just a great ease, and it's this idea of the independent bookstore as the center of a town's life, which I think. Um, uh, e. Shavers uh, exemplifies more than I think any other bookshop I've ever been in in the world. I honestly mean that. I, fi I think it's my favorite bookshop in the world. Oh my gosh, Jessica, those are... Uh, <laughs> okay, wow. I'm, I'm going to bring out my Southern and say hi to Claire. <laughs> you make me blush now, but wow. Thank you. Jessica, that is high praise indeed. Um, E. Shavers was uh, opened in 1975. You've been a co-owner since 2015. Um, uh, will you say a little bit about that experience and about some of the recent evolution of the bookstore? We, we chatted a little bit about it um, ahead of time, but tell us um, about this experience of owning the best independent bookstore in the world and, uh, and, and, about, and about what's going on right now. So um, I don't know if it's the best independent bookstore in the world because that's pretty heavy praise. And there are some really awesome independent bookstores out there. And um, I, I, I started working at E. Shavers before I bought it. Um, Esther Shaver hired me out of the blue. She just um, called me one day and said, I think you'd fit in well here and you should come work for us. And so it was supposed to be one day a week and then it was three days a week. And um then about two years after that, she announced she was going to sell the bookstore, which made me sad because I finally had found my people. And um, but, it, you know, independent bookstores are hard to run. And Esther was in her 70s at that point and had been doing it for 40 years. And 
was ready to retire. So um, after much contemplation and discussion with my my family, I decided that I would make the leap. And um, so I partnered with Esther for a year just to make sure that it would be viable because it was um, a little bit on the downswing when I inherited it or got it. And um, and just much to my surprise and joy, it's it's turned around and it's it's thriving now. And so I, I couldn't, you know, be happier. And I'm not always sure how it works, but I'm I'm really glad that we're where we are. And we're hoping to um, actually have a, a second very small location so we can really um, work more with our local community too. And um, and then we have some plans for the future for a potential nonprofit branch of eShapers. So. That's so fantastic. we've got lots of ideas and so um, yeah, every, every town needs a bookstore, it needs a good bookstore. Yeah. Well, I want to talk to you about the town that you're in. And first, I just want to remind the uh, online audience, people who are watching us now and people who are going to watch this video in future time, that uh, the purpose of the show is to support independent booksellers. We are dropping links in the chat so that you can head over to eShavers and uh, pick up a book, perhaps this one. Yeah. Uh, uh, perhaps another, uh, but um, I encourage you, if you're able to do that, to please go ahead and do so and also drop any questions or comments you have for George or Jessica in the chat. Um, I want to ask the two of you, and I'll come to you first, George, about Savannah. Um, in, his, uh, in his sort of comments for this book, Neil Gaiman uh, uh, wrote that the kingdoms of Savannah um, uh, could only have been written by someone who knows Savannah and its stories intimately and wants them to be told. Um, George, I wonder if you'd say a little bit about the importance of place um, in your work and especially in in this novel. Well, I have always loved um, any kind of novel that is about a place um, and actually any kind of movie that's that seems to be about a place. It seems to be a portrait of a place, particularly if it's a portrait of a place's character. You know that, you know that movie Chinatown um, with Jack Nicholson and Faye Dunaway, um, and and the the sense that you have just when you're four seconds into this movie that you're going to get a full portrait of L.A. and the particular kind of corruption that L.A. embodies. Um, I think my favorite novels when I was an adolescent were the Alexandria Quartet and by uh, Lawrence Durrell. And I just, um, again, this is a, a, you know, four volume portrait of Alexandria, portrait of the characters who live there, but they're so immersed in this place. And it's not simply the place that they're living in, in, you know, in the time that the book uh, was set back in the 20s, but it's also, you know, deeply rooted in Alexandria's past. And I'd always wanted to do that about Savannah because I had come to the city, you know, when I was a boy and had fallen madly in love with it. And really, I guess I'm an eighth generation Savannian. So, um, uh, so my mother always said, well, this is, this is our capital city. So she always had to drive me back. And I found that the city, you know, I find that the city is completely fascinating. Um, and it's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, it's filled with wonderful people. And it's also incredibly dark. And I just wanted to write a book in which the main character was Savannah itself. Mm. Yeah. Um, Jessica, um, Alexandra Jacobs, writing in the New York, uh, New York Times, says that um, George renders Savannah in a kind of knowing detail, maybe not seen since Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, uh, speaking of high praise. What's your take uh, as, a, as a Savannah resident? Does he, yeah. Does he I would agree. Um, so I, you know, The Kingdom of Savannah is one of those books, you know, when you read a book and you're like, oh, this was great. But then you keep thinking about it like it sticks. It's stuck with me. So even this morning I was thinking about, um, yeah, just what a great description of Savannah, The Kingdoms of Savannah is, because 
it's such a different city to different people. Like there's so many different groups and subcultures that you, you can, you can easily fall into a different group of people and see a, a totally different city than what you're used to. And it's not that big. So that's kind of amazing to me. Um, and it, it has a fascinating history. Yeah, I think the book captures a lot of things that we who live here in Savannah think about, but you don't see if you're just visiting for a few days. And mm -hmm. um, that's what I really love about it is that I... Yeah. And it makes me notice things about my own city that, you know, I haven't thought about or haven't thought about in a long time, which is a really good job. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I loved it. I mean, I loved the sense of place in this book. Uh, I'm a northerner. I've actually never been to Savannah. Um, oh. Yeah, and um, it, it very I'm early. Now, aren't you? Yeah. I, I mean, I will. Uh, okay. But v very early in the book, um, a, a ghost tour of um, of tourists rumbles by, and I thought, <laughs> oh my god, that's me. That's uh, I'm, on, I'm on a ghost tour. So I loved, um, I loved the the insider sense of place um, and sort of the intimacy of of um, of place in this book. I thought it was wonderful. Um, We've got a couple of a uh, couple of audience questions coming in, uh, but before we get to those, um, George, I, I I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask you as well. Um, uh, I was um, I was preparing for this um, you know for this interview, and uh, a prior profile of you called you the least Googleable <laughs> author in the world, and. I thought, oh, that's interesting, um, it, but it, it but it turns out to be true. <laughs> I, 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 I tried, I tried. So, um, so here, here's actually here's what I want to ask you though. I want I want to ask you a question about um, about bad storytelling, um, because as I said in the intro, and as I think probably everybody watching knows, in addition to your very successful novels, uh, you're the founder of the Moth, and um, the Moth is just this you know iconic unbelievable storytelling platform, uh, not only in terms of the live performances, but also on the radio hour, uh, you know, podcast, uh, you know, et cetera. And it's this amazing way for people to tell their stories and for other people to have an empathic response. And it's just, you know, it's just, it's just fabulous storytelling. And it's, it's beloved because of that. Um, now, um, you, um, you, you do have a Facebook page. I know you don't spend a lot of time on it. Uh, you don't. You don't tweet. Uh, you don't Instagram. I believe. Um, I'm sure you don't TikTok. Um, you know. But I guess. I guess my question for you is, um, why? Why do some platforms lend themselves to bad storytelling? Why isn't? Why? Why can't a tweet or a post? Or, or a TikTok or something like that convey the same thing as sort of a moth, moth performance? Why is it that some venues lend themselves to this, to these great stories and others just seem, seem to be so, so toxic? I mean, what, what do you think about that? I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a really fascinating question, isn't it? Because it's really the essence of what we're going through um, in civilization. I, I, I think that from the very beginning, you know, we started the moth in 97. And from the very beginning, there people were thrilled to have uh, this place that they could go to. It's not just about the storytelling. It's about the quality of listening. So we would pack rooms um, with lots and lots of people. And we encouraged people to be silent. Um, and so in, when there's a good story on and you can hear a pin drop, um, there's also kind of a flow going back and forth between, um, between the raconteur and, you know, and the audience. I remember in one of the very first moths we did, I guess maybe it was the second or third one, um, Frank McCourt, the author of Angela's Ashes, came to tell a story about teaching. And... Um, and I was sort of standing in the back still, you know, uh, I don't know, letting people in, you know, or whatever. And then I kind of came in. And so I was at the back and I, I didn't know for a second if Frank McCourt was on yet. 
And then I realized, well, he was on, he was just being very, very quiet as he told his story. He had a microphone, but he had this very, very quiet delivery. And so I leaned forward to hear, and I looked around and saw that the audience around me was also, everyone was leaning forward. And he wasn't pushing himself out there. He was, and I can't, I would never try to do that Irish lilt of his, but in just the very softest way that he was telling us about these kids that he had taught in New York. And I, re I learned something then about storytelling, that it requires a great storyteller, lets the audience come to him or her. And it happens, and then that experience um, will transform the audience. The, there, there becomes a connection with, uh, with a moth. There's a connection between audience and storyteller that's really like like no other there's no sense of a veil um when there's a good storyteller there's just a sense that this is one organism and that's such a beautiful experience and anybody who's ever been to the moth um uh notes that and notes it's it's a community experience well that's not what you're going to get with tiktok you're going mm -hmm. to get there's a there's a community but there's that electronic veil um, and it's kind of cold and it doesn't, yeah, to me, it doesn't feel satisfying at all, which is why I sort of stayed off of social media. But I do have um, my editor and agent are constantly prodding me gently to yeah. perhaps reconsider. <laughs> Engage. Yeah, no, I've had the same experience. Um, uh, Jessica uh, E. Shavers was founded, as I said, in 1975. There was no internet. Uh, yeah. We now we now live in a world where um, you, your store has social media accounts. Mm -hmm. um, you are um, you are you have we have Zoom for events, uh, yeah. you know things like that. Book your you have many, many book clubs. I'm sure that they mm -hmm. zoomed over the course of the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. What is your feeling about social media and technology and independent book selling? Has it been um, has it been a benefit? Does it does it bedevil you? Um, what's what's your feeling? It's kind of a combination of all yeah. those things. So when I bought the bookstore, um, <laughs> there was no internet at eShavers either. So it was, um, it was old school. And so we built a lot of that because we've had to. Um, but it is, it is very time consuming. Um, and it's something you have to keep. Book talk has become this huge phenomenon now. And really drives, I mean, the numbers are there. It really drives sales. And um it is an interesting format, you know, where you show the pretty pictures and, and do a quick take on the book. Um, I, it brings people into the bookstore who may not have come into the bookstore. Um, mm -hmm. But it does, like we have someone, I, I do some of it and I'm older and so I'm not quite as good. Like I, I don't, we don't have TikTok yet, but we, we may perhaps have it at some point. And um and we have someone who's come on who who does like the reels and the stories for the bookshop because um, because it's it's become you know part of the job. Um, so I can tell you that people love cats on the internet. <laughs> as as I want them to love the pictures of books and everything that we do. If we post a picture of a cat, it. What? It just it goes viral. Yeah. When I when I was publicizing my first book, I got a I don't have a cat, but I got a friend to let me take a picture of her cat with my book. I get and then I and we put it out there, and that was what that was what got the most response. Oh. You know, I just like Mr. just a random Elliot. cat. <laughs> Mr. Elliot, um, bookshop cats will pick him up from time to time for different yeah. things. Uh, just thousands of likes. It's yeah. incredible, but all you know, on pub day, put my stack of books and a yeah, hundred people will like it, but it, that's better than it when it started out. So yeah, um, yeah it's an interesting phenomenon. And, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Yeah. I've been trying to, I've been trying to get my 13 year old to run a TikTok for my upcoming book. And um, cause I, I don't think I can figure it out, but you no, know, we'll see. Um, George, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, George, uh, uh, audience question for you, uh, something I've been wondering about too, about the moth performances and how do you, um, 
how do you prepare a moth performance? And I was thinking about that actually, because I um, actually earlier today, I went back and I listened to um, your performance of Coming of Age in a Mausoleum uh, <laughs> from 2016, uh, no, it's 2014, uh, on, in the archives, in the moth archives. It was fat, it's a, just a beautiful, strange, moving story. And, and I had that same thought, I, so I had that same question. I said, does George just sit down and write this, like writing a short story? Or is this like doing stand up where you've got to get, get in front of people and kind of like work it out and try it out and see what works and stuff like that? How, how do you make it? How do you make these? Oh, well, it's a little bit of both. I mean, yeah. you, can, you can sit down and make notes and you kind of get an idea about what you're going to say. And then we have brilliant directors. Um, um, who uh, help us through those stories. That uh, was Catherine Burns, the artistic director of The Moth. Um, and so, you know, I'll tell a version of the story and then Catherine will say, God, I really like that character. Can we talk about that character? And I mean, a lot of times we're asking these very essential questions when we're directing uh, moth storytellers. We'll say, well, what is the... I mean, for me, this is the number one question. You say, what is the essential decision of your story? Because there are a lot of decisions made in any story, but there's almost always one essential decision. And uh, once you understand what that essential decision is, then everything in the story, every, uh, everything can be wrapped around that central decision. And anytime, actually, you look at any novel um, uh, or, or any play, you can find the central decision. And then the question is, if, if, if that decision is made really vivid, then I think audiences will respond. Um, and, and that's really what we're doing when we're directing moth stories, is we're bringing out um, all of the elements that go into, and it might be just one little decision. It might be a decision once, I remember challenging Adam Wade, one of our great moth raconteurs, to tell a story about going in and ordering a ham sandwich in a deli. And I thought I was joking, but then he did it. And it was such a beautiful story because it was, again, it was about which sandwich am I going to, to order here and what does it mean to me? You know, what is the, you know, and it's so anyway, that's what we do. We do a lot of um, we know a lot of, you know, little tricks that we've learned over the years, things that um, great ways to end a story, um, things to focus on. Yeah. But I think essentially it comes down to learning how to wrap a story around a decision. I love that way of framing it, uh, uh, wrapping a story around a decision. I think that's great. I should, um, I should mention to the audience there is a relatively – new book out from the moth um how to tell a story um if you'd like to hear more about this it is available from e shavers mm -hmm. uh we're gonna we're gonna drop the link in the uh in the chat so um again we are here to support independent book selling and one way to do it is to pick up a copy of uh george's book and also of how to tell a story um but i love that wrapping a story around a decision um george um um questions about um about the the movies um of course two, two of your books have been made into major motion pictures uh caveman's valentine with samuel l jackson the juror with uh to be more and alec baldwin um i don't know um yeah i don't know if there's anything you'd like to say about that in terms of that experience of seeing a work carried from the page to the screen the question i had for you about it actually was whether you were surprised by the commercial success of those early novels. I mean, when, when you wrote those novels, did you sort of think like, oh man, like these are super cinematic, like I'm gonna like, this is gonna like, this is gonna like, this is gonna be it. Or, or were you surprised that, you know, that Hollywood came calling? I was really shocked by the juror um, when the juror sold. And although The Cape Nouns Valentine is my first movie, I mean, my first uh, novel, it was not the first made into a movie. Um, the juror was and it was one of those things where the book goes to my agent on a Monday and by Thursday there's uh, there were just a lot of um, Hollywood studios bidding for the rights to make this um, it's 
struck people as the, I guess people started reading this book and they were instantly swept away. And um, it was just one of those stories that they said, okay, we have to do this. Um, I didn't see that. Um, I didn't know what I saw. I just knew that I, uh, I was, yeah, I was trying to write a beautiful story, um, but I was trying to write a thriller. I was trying, I was very deliberately saying, I want to write a story that is an absolute page turner. I, I think that that's a joyful exercise to have that sense of, you know, when, when, when you just feel like every page has an arrow on it pointing to the next page and you're just fall into that, um, into that strange Zen state when you're reading a book. Um, when you're writing a book, it was, it was a great, great fun for me and a great challenge to focus on that. Um, and so, yeah, but I was totally shocked. I mean, it sort of took me out of the world that I had been in and yeah, it changed everything very, very quickly. Yeah, for sure it did. Um, you know, Jessica, something I wanted to ask you about, this is I, actually in these interviews, I oftentimes ask booksellers about mm -hmm. the degree to which they feel that they're able to anticipate commercial success for books and you know George is talking about being surprised by his own work and what happened to it do, do you find as a bookseller that arcs will come in and you will know this thing is going to be a bestseller you know this thing is going to be a Netflix series or whatever or or do you just sort of feel like you might as well just throw them throw them on the floor <laughs> throw a dart and, and and I mean what, what do you think well, it's, it's a little more precise than that these days because we have more tools at our disposal. So, um, you know, independent booksellers, booksellers in general, we use Edelweiss and we work with our reps. So we do have a little idea of how many books are going to be printed for a specific book, which indicates how into it the particular publisher is. And, and so that gives us some direction. And then um, the magic of an independent bookstore though, is that our bestsellers are really the books that we read. So because we, you know, we have a staff that's fully engaged in reading. If we put something in our staff picks, or if we decide something, you know, may be overlooked that we think is fantastic, then that's what we sell in the store. So we're not as driven. I mean, of course, we're going to carry the the big books. And, and we use the Indies Next list for our bestsellers. We don't use the New York Times. We report to the New York Times, but we don't use that as what's going to sell in our store because that's really not what sells in our store. What sells in our store are the, the books that Indies love. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a tricky thing. I mean, if I can get my, if my staff loves a book, um, then we're going to sell a ton of it no matter what. So, um, yeah, that's, well, that that, which is what I love about being an independent bookstore. Like, Oh yeah. I mean, that was going to be my follow up question is whether you feel like you can shape what becomes uh, a best selling, you know, <laughs> whether you can shape sales and it, and, and, and you do. It, for us, we do. I mean, I, not for the nation, of course, but but for for our corner of the world, we do. Um, and we, and Melissa and I, work hard to curate what's in the bookstore. So, um, you know, we we really, yeah, we spend a lot of time with our lists and with our reps choosing what's going to be on the shelf because we have limited space and and we we want to be able to reach out to to pretty much everyone who comes in our door. I mean, occasionally we're going to get people who are not going to like what we have. And that's, that's fine. That's, I'm not doing a good job if I, you know, don't occasionally offend someone, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's, I mean, that's one of the joys of my job. I mean, it's what I love doing. Um, and I don't get as much time on the floor anymore because we've grown, but when I do um, being able to hand sell books is just, I mean, you know, I don't think there's anything better than that, really. Oh, yeah, I mean, from both sides, from both sides of the transaction, I mean, I just think it's one of the best things. Um, George, we've got a, um, a viewer question with a follow up about this um, uh, this issue of, of of place, and just um, pointing out that I believe, and I believe this is right, that you actually you don't live in Savannah any you know, at this point, 
Uh, I know, I know uh, Jessica was telling us earlier that you were beloved in Savannah and that your launch packed in, you know, 150 people or, or whatever it was, which is awesome. But uh, the, the, uh, the audience question is, living away from uh, Georgia, um, does that allow you to, when you're, when you're writing this place, this location, does that distance allow you to see it more clearly? Does it, do you have to fight off a sense of nostalgia? Uh, you know, what does it mean to, to write Georgia when you're sitting in New York? Um, or wherever I was. I mean, I moved around as I was writing this, but I did find that being away from Savannah really, really helped. Mm. Um, I, I took a lot of trips back. I had been living in Savannah, um, you know, for many years and then, uh, and then uh, moved back to uh, Brooklyn. Um, I, but I did find that uh, the Savannah that I'm writing about in Kingdoms of Savannah is a bit fantastical. And I do think that an author needs to imagine a city. I mean, my Savannah is a bit of an imaginary city. One part imagination and one part um, and one part memory and one part uh, history. I think all of the history that I put in in the book um, is, to the best of my knowledge, true. Um, I've done a lot of research, but a lot of the you know this the wandering around some of the neighborhoods I describe are a bit fantastical and that's easier when you're not living there. You really feel like it does give you the license to dream. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I had a question. Oh, go ahead, Jessica, please. Sorry, I was just gonna say though, even though it's a fantastical Savannah, it's not that far off. I mean, the, the names, people are named things like that here. That's, that's not out of the ordinary. Um, so it is, but it's not, it's interesting. It's, it's a you know, great, yeah. Yeah, there's an interesting point about that. One of my dear friends in Savannah, um, who knows Savannah very well, um, and I won't mention her name now, but when I showed her the book, she said, well, I, and she really, she just loved the book, and she was um, uh, quite swept away by it, but she said, you know, I don't know anybody on, uh, of the, she was uh, one of the wealthier people in Savannah and she said we don't know anybody who lives in the homeless encampments um, because one of the of the principal characters of the book is a man who comes from uh, wealth but is now living in a homeless encampment um, for various complex reasons and she said well we don't know anybody like that and then I said well do you know this gentleman? And she said, well, yeah, of course. And I said, well, do you know that he was living in a homeless encampment four months last year? She said, no. I said, well, do you know this gentleman? <laughs> and she said, yes, of course. And I found it was interesting that the city is more fantastical than people realize. And there's more of this shuttling between what I call the kingdoms of Savannah, these, these different neighborhoods. Um, and there, there's, there's a lot going on in this city that people don't know. And the stories are all where there's these multi-layered stories of Savannah that when you sit around in a group of Savannians, it's such a rich experience because someone always has another layer to the story that you didn't suspect. Mm -hmm. It is a re truly fantastical city. And as Jessica says, what's amazing is that it's so small. You know, it's not a large place, but it's just this small city packed with history and stories like none other, I think, in this country. I have a question about it, and I'd say jump ball for either one of you to take this. Mm -hmm. But um, this book is referred to as Southern Noir. Um, you know, Neil Gaiman says it's the apotheosis of Southern Gothic Noir. Uh, the New York Times review says it has the flavor of Southern Gothic without the bitter aftertaste. <laughs> um, a, a, few, uh, a few months ago, I was interviewing the author Eli Craner, uh, the Arkansas writer whose uh, debut, Don't Know Tough, has been um, very successful. And, and that book has been called Southern Noir. And I asked him, what does that mean? And he said, you know, 
I, I wrote it and I don't really know what it means. <laughs> I wrote the book and I'm not sure what it means. I, I feel like it's, you know, like that old definition of pornography. I know it when I see it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, but I, I well, can one of you take a stab at telling us what is Southern Gothic? What is, what is, what is Southern Noir? What does that mean? Oh, I'd love to hear your definition mm -hmm. of it, Jessica. Me? Um, I don't, I mean, Savannah, Flannery O'Connor is from Savannah. Um, the South is just such a multifaceted place and it, you know, I, it's the history, it's the, um, it, it's, I, it, it is what we live kind of. I mean, it's just, Savannah just lends itself to that. I, I don't know a good definition of it other than it just explains the peculiarities of, of being Southern mm. <laughs> and living in this, you know, I'll tell stories to my friends that live in the North about going calling with my grandmother or other things. And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and it, this is just normal for us. So, um, yeah, um, we, we just, I don't know. We just live in, I don't know, George, you've, I'm, I'm not doing well at, at defining. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do well at, e at it either. I mean, I love when people say that I'm a Southern Gothic, you know, that I write Southern Gothic noir or Southern Gothic. I love that because I, you know, it's such an, you know, and uh, people compare it to Robert Penn Warren. I mean, brilliant, brilliant writers. Um, and I suppose that the definition is probably wrapped up in um, the horrors of the South, the, the mm -hmm. terrible uh, sense of, uh, the, the the caste system and the class distinction um, and and the lies that were perpetrated to um, propel that along and how every it, I'm trying to express this everything that's done in the south can be a it can be beautiful and it can be a an act full of grace, and yet it feels as though somewhere at the heart of it is this is this rot um, mm -hmm. that that comes from you know from from this terrible uh, caste system, and mm -hmm. I, so I think I felt that I've been steeped in that from you know earliest childhood. The sense we're given these narratives. Um, and the narratives are false and we can feel their falsity and the narratives are there to support the caste system. Mm -hmm. And those narratives and the very falsity of them gives the whole atmosphere um, uh, a sense of drama. And so it, you know, makes for great fiction. Um, not necessarily for great lives. No. It's a great definition. It's a great, I, yeah, I had a thought, um, embracing yeah. the absurd is kind of mm -hmm. what yeah. we, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, well, for the viewers, for the viewers who want to taste, I know that one thing we've put in the chat is a link to pick up some Flannery O'Connor from mm -hmm. eShavers, if you really want to sink your teeth into some Southern yeah. Gothic. Um, uh, George, Jessica, we're getting to that time in the show when we want to uh, support the bookstore and sell some books. <laughs> and so I am going to remind the audience that, uh, that you should buy some books and there's only one place you should do it, which is from eShaver. Uh, do not click that button on your phone that will take you to an online retailer. Go to uh, independent book selling. Uh, obviously, pick up a copy of The King of Go Savannah, but uh, we're going to line up too shamelessly. <laughs> yes, let's go. Oh, there's no shame. Uh, Jessica, I'll start off with you because you're the professional. And then, George, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you for a couple of uh, thoughts and recommendations. But, Jessica, what are you reading? What are you excited about? What do you think people should be, uh, should be looking at? And, uh, viewers, check out the links in the chat. Mm hmm. Um, so the Crane's Wife, um, actually, I, I the Crane's Wife by C.J. Hauser. 
Um, it's a memoir and essays, and it is um, it is absolutely fantastic. You feel like you're hanging out with your good friend, just having these frank discussions about life and decisions and and where you're going to end up. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, so I finished that recently. I'm currently reading Tomorrow, Tomorrow, and Tomorrow by uh, Gabrielle Zevin. And it's just such a beautiful book. Um, I have been waiting. I'm at a point where I just want to just completely dive into it and not be distracted. So I'm saving it for an upcoming airplane ride that's going to happen on Friday. And I know I'm going to cry on the plane and it won't be the first time. And that's fine <laughs> because, um, yeah, I tend to, so I tend to really immerse myself in my, it, myself in my books ever since I was a child. So I feel like I'm living like a half-life of the characters that I'm reading about in their world and then, you know, my everyday boring life. And so um, that one. And then um, Jillian Barnes' new book, Elizabeth Finch. I'm about halfway into that guy. And I also can't wait to finish that while I'm on vacation. So Fantastic. Those are great recommendations. Um, George, I'd love to hear about any books you're feeling excited about. And I just, know, I, yeah. I did just finish this book called Always Crashing in the Same Car by mm -hmm. Matthew Spector. And the reason that I love this book, I mean, I just loved it. It's, but you know, you were asking me about the sense of place. It's a book about LA. Um, it's a memoir. It's mixed in with uh, histories of various um, LA people that we, oh, maybe we knew a little bit, and then they wound up as what we might call failures. People who hadn't, you know, people who had just this moment, this meteor meteoric career, and for a moment they were stars, and then they never did anything else again. And Matthew Spector's asking the question about failure because he felt that he was a failure, a writer who had uh, never really had a big hit. And so he's asking these questions and as he is, and he's looking at like the Hollywood movie star, Tuesday Weld. I don't know if that name, if you remember Tuesday Weld, but she was really big back in the seventies. Um, he's looking at these writers, um, mostly writers, some movie stars. And the, the answers he comes up with when he really looks into their lives and how they adjusted to oh, I'm not a big success after all, but after all, what in Hollywood is a big success? Because everybody everybody has somebody th that they can look up to, you know? Somebody says, oh yeah, I just had a hit movie, but uh, now I'm having dinner with Spielberg. Well, I ain't Spielberg, so do I feel like a little wormy person? Um, and anyway, I just thought that this was an incredibly moving examination where he is finally able to understand that, you know, some people are able to say, okay, I'm not that big success that I thought I was going to be. And it really doesn't matter to me in any way. It's just a really fascinating. So the book is called Always Crashing in the Same Car. Sounds fabulous. It does sound. Um, sounds amazing. Um, George, you'd mentioned earlier sort of your love of thrillers and a, a books that sort of, you know, keep you just sort of like going, going. Is there a book that was sort of for you, like the first book that you really turned you on to thrillers or that you think is sort of like the essential thriller that people must read if they're not thriller readers? Well, I, I guess, I mean, I, the first thrillers I ever read were by Dostoevsky. You know, they were, <laughs> the, um, Crime and Punishment is pretty, uh, was pretty riveting um, to me. Um, and then, but the book that I think really said, where I said, you know, because at the time I was, I was writing a lot of poetry, but I thought, no, I actually want to launch into this. Um, and I think uh, uh, that was Silence of the Lambs. It was so beautifully constructed. I just, I thought that the scaffolding of that book was extraordinary. And I went, I actually... Um, I made so many notes in that book. I just kept reading and rereading just to see how does he arrange, how does he arrange each of these chapters to make them so completely riveting? And 
It, it also required creating uh, astonishing characters and being, you know, astonishingly original. But it was Silence of the Lambs more than anything. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I Fabulous. didn't sleep for a week after I read that book. <laughs> And then went back and read it again. Because... Right, right, right. Well, we are, uh, it's hard to believe, but we are winding down on time. It's been um, a complete pleasure speaking with both of you. Um, Jessica, we, uh, we traditionally uh, wind down these interviews um, uh, with a bookseller, with a qu final question to the bookseller. <laughs> and uh, and it, is always, it is always this. Mm -hmm. um, being a successful independent bookseller, is part luck, part hard work, and part what else? Oh, love for what you do. Um, yeah. Really, I think that, um, yeah, I, I, I can't even imagine myself doing anything else at this point. So, I yeah. That. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. People have said pizza. People have said all kinds of things, <laughs> but, I, but, I, but, I, but I love that answer. Um, such a pleasure to speak to the two of you. Thank you both so, so much for spending the time speaking to us today, being on Authors Love Bookstores. Uh, to the online audience, please, you have no shortage of links now available to head over to eShavers and, uh, oh, I think we lost George, but, uh -oh. um, but we still have you, Jessica, to head over to eShavers and to um, uh, pick up a copy of George's book, The Kingdoms of Savannah, a fabulous book which is the apotheosis of Southern Gothic, according to Neil Gaiman, who knows a thing or two. Mm -hmm. uh, pick, up, um, pick up a lot of other books that we've been talking about here today, support independent book selling. Come back next week. Uh, come back um, uh, same time uh, uh, next week. We will be at, uh, oh, we got George Beck. Hello, um, I have no idea. Absolutely. It's, it is the age we live in that our machine, <laughs> machines are working against us. But um, to the online audience, head back next week, same time, same place. We will be at The Poisoned Pen Ooh, with, nice. author, yes, with <laughs> author Isabella Moldando, and it will be a great conversation. So come back then. Until then, keep supporting independent book selling, stay well, and keep reading.